time we had three and it was a rainy night and a long program that got started late. But I'm sure he's used to all kinds of uh, that sort of thing. And as he, not only in the movement, but it happens everywhere. I, I imagine it even happens to the regular administration. Um, but he has come a long way in many ways. Uh, because as you, I'm sure you know, uh, Dan started out uh, in the belly of the monster, so to speak, uh, working for the Rand Corporation and in the Pentagon with the Pentagon uh, until on the road to Damascus, which I believe was very near here uh, at Hattiesburg. Uh, and there was a War Resisters International Conference, a uh, triennial conference at Haverford in 1969, to which I understand Dan attributes um, his final decision to expose the Pentagon Papers um, because of the people that he talked with there, uh, conscious objectives, war resistance, and, and people who were risking their lives and uh, ready to go to jail for it. And uh, that's, I, I believe, the point at which uh, Dan decided to expose, to, to re release the Pentagon Papers. And I don't think I need to say more since that. I think what, what has happened since then is a matter of public record, and uh, uh, he has been speaking and writing ever since uh, on behalf of the peace movement. Dan Ellsberg. Thank you. I was going to suggest we all get up too. I like that idea. <clears throat> Long, hot evening. I'm really delighted to see so many children here, especially earlier, but I have had an eerie feeling about this. I left my four-year-old at home, almost four, and I just think we all would have heard a good deal more from him than we've heard from these children. I can't understand it. Uh, why aren't they saying, I'm ready to go home now? So I'm going to be hearing from Michael. Very impressive. Uh, Molly Rush's children still here or not? There you go. Yeah? The unindicted co-conspirators. I'm very... Uh, <laughs> I think it's a good idea for you to be able to meet some of the people of your own generation here that you'll be conspiring with the rest of your lives. I, that's why I've taken Michael to every, uh, every rally in San Francisco area and Stanford. He's been in some small ones and some big ones. It's good training. I know that uh, when Dave Dillinger was organizing the March on Washington in 69, November 15th, before that, <coughs> there was the <coughs> um, moratorium. I remember attending the moratorium with my children, who were 10 and 13, in that month of October 69. It was also in that month that we spent an evening once with uh, my son Robert, some of you know, who was then 13, was at the Xerox machine uh, copying the Pentagon Papers, and I was collating them. There were 7,000 pages. My daughter, who was 10, Mary, was cutting top secret off the top and bottom of the pages with a system. <laughs> turned out to be useful work, and your mother has just done some very useful work. And I suspect that, uh, I suspect that you, you will too. Uh, it's, it's catching, that kind of example. In fact, uh, my son has now been in jail a good deal more than I have. My daughter is in Nicaragua at this moment now in the health ministry, actually uh, teaching literacy in a village in Nicaragua. So, uh, and I'll be happy if, uh, thanks to the efforts of the Plowshare 8 and us and millions of other people in the world, uh, there is a world old enough for Michael Gabriel, my four-year-old, and you and the others to be resisting the draft 15 years from now, 18 years from now. Because those problems won't go away. What we're working for is, uh, uh, that might sound hopeless to some people, they don't really like to hear that. They think this is the last campaign, is how long can this go on? We're trying to keep it on, going on, uh, for a kind of struggle 
that will go on all our in our children's lives, and as long as there are children, which is what it's about. Not only struggle, of course, we have to learn <coughs> how to celebrate and find joy uh, in the course of all that. I must say I'm looking forward to the uh, prosecution case in a couple days uh, in hopes that they won't have just 8 by 10 glossy photos of this uh, crime, but possibly a tape recording. Is that possible? Because I want to hear the sound of the hammer on this Mark 12A uh, note. I have a fantasy. I have a fantasy that when they hit it right and they hit it right, uh, it rings like a bell, <laughs> like, that? like a liberty bell. It looks like one after they finish it. And um, <laughs> what is such a device for? Actually, incidentally, looking for hope. Uh, before I get to that. It occurred to me, I picked up the front page of the New York Times here, and it seems to me there's some basis for hope here. Let's say direct, I say direct action is catching. Here it says, uh, direct U.S. action is possible. Headline today. <laughs> Reagan's chief policy advisor uh, said today, the United States, quote, this is the New York Times now, so, quote, does not rule out anything, end quote, in its efforts to halt arms deliveries to left-wing guerrillas in El Salvador. I take it that's a tactful way of telling his right-wing supporters that we're about to stop military aid to the torturers uh, in the government in El Salvador and possibly other radical changes in El Salvador. He doesn't rule out anything, you know. <laughs> and uh, in fact, he goes a little further. He says the Reagan administration will take the necessary steps to keep the peace any place in the world. And that includes El Salvador. And after the last speech, it's. In other words, we'll, we'll make war on anyone, anywhere, uh, whatever it takes to make it. <laughs> what it is exactly, well, the next quote is rather significant, I'll get back to that. Does he rule out nuclear weapons? Well, actually, I think, um, first of all, I think that if asked that, Mies would have said, and I'll come back to this point, we don't rule out anything. But we don't believe he would use nuclear weapons. In El Salvador, do we? I don't think that's not an immediate possibility or likelihood. Where, after all, are the uh, Mark 12 A's going to be used? What for? What purposes do they possibly serve? Deterring Soviet attack? As Carter pointed out, a single Poseidon submarine has warheads enough on it to threaten every large and medium-sized city in Russia. He's referring to 218 cities, over 100,000. A Poseidon submarine has 224 warheads on it, each several times the size of Hiroshima. We have 41 such submarines, 31 Poseidon, 10 Polaris submarines, which can only threaten 160 targets each. About 28 to 30 of those submarines are at sea at all times, each one of which, as I say, threatens that target system in Russia has that capability, not one of which can be knocked out by the entire Russian nuclear force sent against it. They do not have any submarine warfare capabilities capable of taking out one of those submarines, each one of which has a retaliatory power which did not exist in the United States in the early 50s at a time when we had a monopoly, which we hardly dreamed of ever having. As I say, we have 30 of them at sea. The Mark 12As, which are 2,000 of which are to go on the MX in addition to everything I've said, have nothing to do with deterring a nuclear attack on the United States. Nothing. They don't add anything to that for the 60 to 100 billion dollars that you pay for it. And the higher price, the prolongation of the arms race the certainty that that means the explosion soon of proliferation as other countries do give up hope and what do we say to the Americans? Give up hope that either superpower will ever live up to the promises they made in the non-proliferation treaty to take serious uh, steps to end the arms race specifically. <clears throat> so the other countries will get the nuclear weapon the uh, possibilities of accident, of authorized action, of wars between smaller countries with nuclear weapons, all these increase, the possibilities of escalation, very clearly then 
threatening the long-term, even medium-term, security of the United States. Every warhead at it, every warhead that, in effect, targets on arms control, that destroys almost the possibility for effective arms control. Why? Uh, what's it for? That's not a rhetorical question. I find that most people in the anti-war movement, like most people in the country, when asked that question, will admit that they, it isn't quite clear to them what these, why these warheads are being built by GE. Obviously, GE gets some profits out of it, uh, more out of the vehicles than out of uh, the warheads that are built, Rocky Flats and elsewhere. There are jobs involved uh, in particular parts of the country. There are votes uh, that can uh, corrupt even one of the best people in the Senate, uh, my Senator Alan Cranston fought for the B-1, it's fought for all these developments because it's jobs in California. Is this the only reason for measures that I say not only cost hundreds of billions of dollars, but almost rule out the possibility of arms control? And let me specify that or it's on in one further aspect, in an even more specific aspect. The Mark 12A specifically, by threatening the security of the Soviet retaliatory system, drives them almost necessarily to similar measures, probably toward mobile missiles that will evade the Mark 12A so that they will retain a land-based retaliatory system. Those mobile missiles will probably not be verifiable. So even the gestures that we've made, uh, mock as they have been, toward uh, ending the arms race will probably uh, not be spoken of much anymore after the next few years when the MX and the other aspects of this go. Why pay what even the uh, elites in this country that back such weapons can see is a long-term risk for this level? When could you ever use it? Answer. We used it last month. And we use the neutron bomb, which we've been producing for a while, even if it isn't deployed yet. We used it this way. And if it wasn't noticeable to you, it wasn't because it was quite secret, but because maybe people found it hard to believe what they were hearing. Reagan was asked a month ago what his plan was for securing our access to, quote, our oil in the Middle East. And how, much did, how did it differ from Carter's plan? He came up. He did not come up with a really new plan. What he gave was essentially the same answer Carter gave, with the same implication. But what he said was he would send troops to create a presence in the Persian Gulf, but fewer troops, even, than Carter proposed to send. He would not pretend, I'm paraphrasing here, but only slightly, he would not pretend to send enough troops that could actually stop the Russians with non-nuclear force on the ground in the Persian Gulf, or, say, in northern Iran. So the interviewer asked him, is this then a bluff? Won't the Russian interests walk through this? No, said President Reagan. They would know that given the American presence there, the presence deliberately and obviously too small to be intended to stop them uh, with non-nuclear force alone, they would be risking World War III. Now, they would not be risking the ne a felt necessity to initiate nuclear war themselves. The point there is that even if we send a lot of troops, they'd be outnumbered by some calculations 22 to 1 because of the, the sinister foresight of the Russians to have their border uh, next to our oil in the Persian Gulf. <laughs> and uh, uh, given that uh, ironic twist of geography, uh, paradoxical situation. The only way we can keep the Russians then, uh, with certainty, out of exploiting some opportunity in, the, um, in northern Iran, <coughs> as in Afghanistan, right now, is to threaten World War III, that is, our initiation of nuclear war. That is using nuclear weapons as a gun is used when you point it at someone's head in an alley. You're always also using a gun when you uh, have it on your hip or when you're known to have it in the house. 
That's a use of it too, but this is a more subtle use. This is a use in a direct confrontation to a child, hypothetically. But it's more than that. I, I, it isn't just hypothetical. I mean, it is using it right now, an instrument of U.S. policy. The threat is being made in what is perceived as a crisis situation, and not for the first time. Jimmy Carter, for all of them, believed to a degree sincere, uh, his sincere reluctance to rely on nuclear weapons. He talked about moving toward the abolition when he moved in, who came into office. Found himself in his last year of office using nuclear weapons in the same way that John Foster Dulles used them in the 50s, and that Reagan is using them this year. To be sure, they're no longer saying, we will hit you. But remember, Dulles, even in the 50s, was quite vague about that. He said, we will, an aggressor will not know exactly what we will do. We will uh, retaliate massively at times and places and by means of our own choosing. With that uncertainty there. And here again, of course, Reagan is saying, uh, as did Carter before him, the enemy can't be sure that we won't. But he's doing more than making verbal allusions like that. He's putting actual, physical, nuclear weapons produced in this country with our tax mayors, designed by our brilliant scientists, manned by American troops, in the Indian Ocean, on cruisers, uh, on carriers, ready to go. And indeed, we're preparing the rapid deployment force to serve as that presence which is frankly described as a tripwire for nuclear war. I mentioned Dulles. Those, some of you who are old enough to remember now, uh, will remember that those threats that Dulles made were generally regarded as bluffs at the time. I, as a Democrat at the time, I think uh, shared that idea that uh, it's a lot of loose talk. Someone now who spent several years studying uh, what is now known about that period and the period since then, and a lot more is knowable now thanks to declassification of some documents. I have to report to you, and this isn't, uh, well, it's not good news or bad news, it's, this is history. He wasn't bluffing. Similar threats were made secretly about a dozen times during that period. Or I should say, about a dozen times occasionally publicly Every president since Harry Truman had occasion in the Oval Office to consider seriously the imminent possibility of initiating nuclear war. Or, and in a number of cases, actually communicating explicit, secret threats to an adversary in a direct conflict and a crisis. Not hypothetical threats of the future, not vague threats, quite precise threats uh, of the possibility of using them under certain circumstances in an immediate confrontation, as is being done right now. I won't take the time at this time of uh, tonight, and some of you have heard this from me before. And anyway, I'll just list these occasions. Uh, often, if I were giving a lecture on this, I'd repay going over them in detail, because I would count that even this select audience here would not have heard of one or uh, uh, more than one or two of these, uh, if that. So I'll just mention them. Uh, Harry Truman tells us, by the way, and this is the least well-documented of all these, actually, but Truman tells us that in 1946, he gave the Russians an ultimatum with nuclear weapons to get them out of Iran, northern Iran, in 1946, when they were prolonging the wartime occupation. He said he would give them 48 hours to get out, or he would drop the A-bomb on He said this repeatedly in various oral histories and articles. There isn't much documentation. That doesn't prove it didn't happen, because all of the other threats, some of which are now very well-documented, were equally secret at the time, even from very close associates of the president. The next one was not secret. Harry Truman in 1950, when Marines were surrounded at the Trojan Reservoir in Korea, said, much in these terms, we are not ruling out the use, we are considering the use of nuclear weapons at that moment. Indeed, they were. The secret plans have been declassified now for rehearsing the possibility of using nuclear weapons in that situation. But the Marines fought their way out the nuclear weapons were not necessary in that, in that case. 1953, Eisenhower tells us in his memoirs that he gave secret threats to the Chinese 
the key would, not might, but would, use them if they did not meet his moderate terms for armistice at Panmunjom, which they did meet, and he attributes that success and their keeping the armistice to his nuclear threats in his memoirs and in the memoirs of other people who dealt with him, like Sherman Adams and others. How many people here remember that or ever knew that in this audience? Well, Dave Dellinger and I see two other hands, three, four. Think about that. That's a piece of history that the Times, I don't know if the, whether the Times has ever seen fit to print it, certainly not at the time, but Americans are not made aware of that by their media, their presidents, or anybody else. The presidents know it, however. 1954, we offered the French three or more nuclear weapons for the defense of Bien Ben Phu. In Indochina, the French rejected them, so they weren't used, but not because we had reservations. In 1958, uh, the President authorized the Joint Chiefs to plan on the use of nuclear weapons against shore batteries in China if they continued their bombardment effectively of the little island of Komoi, a few miles off mainland China, occupied by Chinese nationalist troops. The Chinese desisted in the face of very public discussion of this possibility. They began bombing every other day, so the blockade was broken. Another success for nuclear weapons. In 1961, the Berlin Crisis. Very old. Some of you will remember Kennedy's call for fallout shelters by the end of the year in 1961 because of the possibility of nuclear war. In 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. 1968, Marines again surrounded at Khe San in Vietnam. A lot of public discussion, leaks of purported discussions of the use of nuclear weapons to defend them if necessary. They, those rumors were denied by the White House. The denials were false. The plans and preparations were made. And the recommendation was made to the President that if an attack should occur in bad weather, where we couldn't give close air support, we would have to consider using nuclear weapons. The attack was not made. Quite possibly, even probably, I would say, another success for nuclear weapons. And in 1969, threats. In 1969, Haldeman has revealed, <coughs> and others working for Henry Kissinger have confirmed, Nixon made secret threats to the Vietnamese and to their allies that he would use or might use nuclear weapons in the course of an escalation he definitely would undertake. November 1st, 1969, and they did not meet his quite ambitious terms, which were never achieved, by the way, the northern troops getting out of South Vietnam. And that was apparently repeated at other times, including as late as December 1972. I repeat, every president then, from Truman to Nixon, we don't have the records on the other. We now have Carter and Reagan already making comparable threats. Uh, not quite an entire crisis, the Russian supposed threat to the Persian Gulf is a good deal more hypothetical, but we are treating it as if it were an ongoing uh, threat. These other cases, though, were, uh, were different to that extent. They were actual, they usually involved actual shooting crises, and the threats were made. Does that begin to give you a clue why American presidents have always refused to commit themselves not to use nuclear weapons first. They have refused to make a no first use commitment, which the Russians have offered bilaterally, the Chinese have made it unilaterally. Presumably the Russians don't make it unilaterally, as I wish they would, because they serve that threat against the Chinese so long as we uh, refuse to give it up. And they have made such threats against the Chinese. But in any case, we haven't been willing at all, because the presidents have made those threats in the past, secretly, usefully, they felt, successfully, in a number of cases, and they're not about to give them up for the future. What lessons might we learn from this history? Uh, to begin to guess, what lessons uh, well, presidents ought to learn? The presidents have known this history, we haven't. So let's, uh, let me just think for a minute what we might draw from. First of all, why didn't the weapons go off, since they were threatened? You notice in the cases that I gave, first of all, a number of them, the answer is, the threats were successful. So they uh, didn't need to go off. Uh, all the Allies refused, as in Vietnam and Food. That explains it for most of the cases. 
How come the threats were that successful? I'll give you two reasons. First of all, one is not so hopeful for the future, the other is considerable. First, most of those successful threats, and you notice the Nixon threat in 69 was not successful, the earlier threats, especially before 68, through the Cuban Missile Crisis, were made in a period not of American superiority, but something amounting to American monopoly of strategic nuclear power. I might say, by the way, that I think uh, the people who are now pressing for this superiority that they want back, and that's what the Mark 12 is for, that's what the MX is for, uh, in fact, have a misreading of history of part. They can't buy back monopoly. There is no way to get it. They can't probably even get superiority, and they know that, given Russian determination in the last 10 to 15 years to achieve parity, which they have now achieved. But they can't conceivably get uh, superior uh, the monopoly they once had. When I say monopoly, I don't mean just the period from 45 to 49. I'm going as late as 1961, that Berlin crisis when we were supposed to worry about fallout shelters. We didn't need fallout shelters in 1961, probably. The war we were talking about would have been a war we would have initiated as a nuclear war in the event of a challenge to Berlin. In that period, the Soviet Union, that period when we had 3,000 bombers within the range of Russia, 2,000 intercontinental bombers, 1,000 tactical bombers in the range of Russia, 70 missiles, including about 32 at sea and about 40 half a <coughs> The Russians had 189 bombers, intercontinental bombers, cable of chaos, and four ICBMs. Soft, liquid fuel above ground in one base and possessed, which could easily have been hit by a single raid with non nuclear munitions. They had nothing to hit us with, essentially. Why the various backdowns were made under those conditions then should not be so hard to imagine. Even so, you notice that nearly all of the threats were made, this is the second one against people who didn't have nuclear weapons. That would seem more prudent. And uh, that's what the presidents thought. And their, uh, their madness is not of the kind of totally incoherent, short-run uh, version. We sometimes attribute to them because we can't figure out what they're doing. They know the difference between aiming, let's say, making threats to Russians, which they do rather circumspectly over that period of time, and people who don't have nuclear weapons. But, in nearly every case, and this we can see in the future too, the people were allies or potential allies of the Soviet Union who did have nuclear weapons. That is the context in which this immense superiority did make itself felt. A considerable confidence that we could threaten credibly to use nuclear weapons on an ally of Russia, like China, or Vietnam, or North Korea. And claim, and actually sincerely claim, that we did not believe that their ally Russia would hit back at us because of this immense superiority. And I can tell you from documents from the inside and from my own experience, that confidence was genuine. And by the way, that we saw in 1972, a time when Russians really had parity, what we did to the Vietnamese uh, while we were drinking champagne in Moscow. And had to be seen by Nixon Nixon's others as considerable confirmation of uh, uh, the caution the Russians would show in this situation uh, while their allies were being bombarded. What the people who favored then the Mark 12A, which is the word for the MX, but also for men and three, is to regain a degree of superiority like something like 1967 or 68, uh, with which to back up the credibility and therefore the effectiveness of future and current threats of tactical nuclear weapons, smaller neutron bombs and others, and those in turn to back up our intervention uh, to protect a status quo, which for you I don't need to characterize the nature of worldwide status quo, we are dependent. <coughs> to back it up with might, 
you back it up in with CIA intervention, financial intervention of various kinds, military if necessary, future expeditionary forces, the rapid deployment force. You send them in areas 10,000 miles away, far from logistic support, far from bases, far from allies. The only way you can possibly pretend to do that and not expect to see them overrun is to have some basis for hope. Hope. We we'll get back to our theme of the evening. That the forces in that area with the capability to overwhelm them will be deterred from acting by the threat of our nuclear, uh, nuclear quote, defense. That those forces 10,000 miles away from their homes where we're defending the U.S. forces. And the hope in which we would use such nuclear defense would be the hope that it would not be met at all. It would be a unilateral use of nuclear weapons. The only basis for such hope is to look overwhelmingly bigger than any other answer, which we don't now. And that's why we're spending a lot of money to get it back. I come back to the point, we don't need that yet, but we don't need it in a way for El Salvador nor did we for the Dominican Republic, or the Bay of Pigs, let's say, that had gone on with that. But notice where, in fact, we're talking about defending our interests. Northern Iran. That's, that is, in geographic terms, to Russia, what El Salvador is to us. Actually, it's closer to what Mexico is to us. If you ask, how can it be that an era now of parity, no longer monopoly, we're spending this enormous amount and taking these risks to make such threats. The answer is you can't stake out an American sphere of influence that goes up to the borders of the Soviet Union and the borders of occupation of Soviet troops. Unless you propose to do that with nuclear weapons, you cannot man that particular frontier with American troops all over, and especially after Vietnam, where 500,000 troops are not going to be available readily for service 10,000 miles away. So the lesson of Vietnam that they learned, in the words of Eugene Rostow, from our Undersecretary of State, did, our failure in Vietnam shows us the cost of allowing strategic nuclear superiority to slip from us. Meaning we weren't able to make threats as brutal uh, as nuclear weapons and uh, end the war that way. That's the lesson they learned. And they're after that. Let's say that may make what they're doing a little more understandable and um, may or may not make it seem uh, easier to beat. The young woman who, who drove me here from the airport happened to raise a question to me. Is it possible the U.S. would use nuclear weapons on a non-nuclear possessing country? And I mentioned to her, well, that's the only way they have been used on people. And I wasn't referring just to the threats. That's the way Harry Truman used them. On Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We don't ordinarily think of it in those terms. But of course, not only was it the case that six months before BE Day, we were aware that Germany, the original rationale and justification for our whole anti-bomb effort, <coughs> did not, that we learned that Germany did not have a comparable Manhattan Project effort. And indeed, in 1945, they were at the stage we were at in 1942. How many people here knew that? How many did not know that? I've asked a lot of people, including the young people, uh, whether they would agree to the idea that if the war had ended a few months later, Germany might have had a bomb. And uh, they all say yes, essentially. You ask yourself what you would have said. They know almost nothing about the process, almost nothing about World War II, but they know that. Do we just barely beat up the Nazis for the bomb? Meaning, no more of us have involved here. We had to do what we did. The fact is that we knew in late 1944 that the Germans didn't have the bomb. They didn't take an afternoon off at Los Alamos for that. They went ahead and went Japan. A country that, of course, we knew did not have the bomb. I'm just saying that was the warning and the prototype of everything so far since then with the exception of a couple of crises that involved, involved the Russians directly. There's one other reason, though, and that gives more hope as to why the bomb didn't go off. And that is, if you look closely uh, at these examples, the patterns, 
you find that our terms that we asked were really quite moderate. The presidents did not go along with ambitious objectives. In fact, if you think it over, uh, Quezon, Chosen Reservoir, Quemoy, also surrounded. It was, these were cases when American or Allied troops were faced with tactical defeat or capture. On one hand, and two other cases, Korea and Vietnam, where there was a possibility, where there, uh, they saw an opportunity to end a long, stalemated war. Those were the two cases. They didn't, in other words, start the war uh, or think of these weapons seriously in cases where Americans were not immediately, or French troops, our allies, were immediately threatened with defeat. Why were they that, that? That's another reason, in other words, why they were as successful as they were. They weren't asking too much. Why not? If you look at the decision-making records, you find in every case the answer was their fear of American public reaction was not an absolute constraint, but it was very strong, and it was enough that they were very anxious, much more anxious than their military advisors, to see a threat succeed without ever having to be made public and without having to be carried out. I'll just tell you, the effect of that was that the president settled in each case for such moderate terms, the Marines weren't overrun, the Chinese nationalists weren't overrun, etc., that the military were absolutely furious with them in almost every case. Another difference. We now have an administration that represents the point of view that has always said we should have used that threat much more boldly. And yet, they are proposing with more ambitious objectives, and yet they're proposing to do it in a world far more risky, a world of parity, a world where other people have weapons. Far more risky than ever was before. Well, the hopeful part is going to say. <laughs> the, uh, the fact that they always felt they had to lie to us and keep this secret, and still do, and still can't really tell us in ways that we hear and understand. They understand, they believe, I think correctly, that the American people would not endorse risks of World War III or just risks of the annihilation of other human beings that are implicit in the smallest use of these weapons for the states they are talking about, even the states of oil of the Middle East, where we get more support probably than any other case, but not enough for them to really be uh, that forthright about. When uh, Ed Meese makes this statement, which is a theme of the Reagan administration, he says this, what exactly would we do? Might we take a naval blockade of Cuba uh, to end the arms uh, in the El Salvador? He said, the president has said many times he would like potential or real adversaries to go to bed every night wondering what we will do the next day. I don't think we would rule out any. Of course, it's a cost of that that we, you and I, go to bed every night and wonder what we will do. <laughs> uh, and that is not unnoticed in the White House. In fact, I think uh, we should read that statement that we, the ones who aren't allowed to know, because by the way, in all the cases I knew, remember, it was not a secret from the enemy. You know, how can it make sense, really, in a crisis to keep the enemy that uncertain? But the adversary, he knows. It's the American people that don't. So we, the ones who do not know, what, quote, we will do the next day, or I think they should understand ourselves to be defined as the adversary, potential or real, in the eyes of the White House, the adversary to these policies. Page has really said it quite obviously in his confirmation there. When asked uh, what he would have done, say, about the terrorists, uh, I'm sorry, about the, uh, the taking of the hostages, what he called terrorists, <coughs> in, uh, in Iran, what would we have done in the past retributions? Absolutely, wouldn't talk about that. And I thought he would use an argument like this because the enemy must be kept uncertain. Haig did it. Haig said, we found in the past, he was all through the Vietnam presidents, of course, we found in the past that when you tell, when you say publicly uh, what it is you have in mind doing, it creates a controversy which may make it difficult to do anything. I mean, anything like nuclear war or, you know, invasion or, North Vietnam or various acts, assassinations and coups and other things that they have in mind, as in Chile, a controversy. In other words, democracy might operate instead of, instead of government by fait accompli, uh, which is uh, what they have in mind for us and what they're sort of proclaiming to us here and asking for our support. 
why are they being so public, as, as much public as they are about all this now? I think finally, and this isn't the most hopeful part, uh, because they really do think some of those bombs are going to have to go off. Their goals are more ambitious. The resistance has been increasingly greater over the years as other people draw lessons from Vietnam that are a little different. Uh, there's more resistance. The natives are restless all over the place. Uh, the, uh, we're facing uh, uh, fancy weapons. Either we or the Russians have actually sold a lot of these cases. The French. Um, and I think they, they are preparing us that the threats are not only going to be made more frequently, now that we no longer are going to send a large expeditionary force, but are going to have to be carried out, since we are going to send a small expeditionary force. The rapid deployment force, with its 10,000 troops, or 2,000 troops, or 50,000 troops, is a portable in Vancouver. It's a movable caisson. You can just put it down anywhere, 10,000 miles away, and wait for it there, somebody to surround it. Giving you the occasion to use your nuclear weapon. If that's your policy, give me the evidence. But the basis for hope, as I say. My, my wife really, uh, Patricia, having for years heard enough of this from me, but she hasn't been, felt the need to study it very much on her own, has been studying it lately. And actually, I noticed it's really increasingly hopeful in ways that almost seem bizarre to me. She said, I didn't know any of this. The American people don't know these things. I believe that their ignorance has, in fact, been critical to their acceptance of it. She finds it quite hopeful, and I think this is valid. At least in comparison to a situation where they knew as much as Reagan knows, let's say, about how we want to promote it, in case he likes to point to it. And still, we're going along with all this. That's, that's not the case. They didn't know this history. They don't know it. You didn't know it. That gives us a real basis, I think, for saying, as in the Vietnam War, when people learn what is being done in their name and why it's being done, they have a challenge and they can do something about it. One last example of, on the hopeful side. When Dave Dellinger and others here, I'm sure you, and uh, Cora Weiss and lots of others who are organizing the, more, the mobilization and the mobilization against the war in Vietnam, the moratorium a month earlier. I've asked a lot of you during the day, A, did you have any notion that Nixon was threatening escalation that month? I asked this question before I knew that the escalation involved nuclear weapons that came in. Just escalation, invasion of North Vietnam, we had in mind, hitting the dikes, bombing all over. All of them have said no. It was, you know, it was unthinkable. Later, yes. But one year from the election, impossible. If we'd seen the plan, I think it would have been hard to believe as anything but a photo. It was actually, you know, it had, it's had its own logic. If you read Nixon's memoir, he said, I'm not gonna, I wasn't going to go into the election in 1972 with that war dragging on, and I had no intention of ending it with anything but, he doesn't use the word victory, but an acceptable outcome to anybody else who would call victory. That's what I meant, he's telling us in his memoir, if you were reading. When I said I'll end the war with honor. Had it begun that year. How do you do it? The same way you maintain U.S. interests on the border of Russia, if that's what you have to do, by threatening the nuclear war on mass suicide. And by threatening the nuclear war, it's no way to do that fast in, in Vietnam. That's what he did. The threat did not work, and it wasn't carried out. And Nixon gives one reason why. Too many people in the streets on October 15th, Moratorium Day, 1969. Too many people expected November 15th. Too many actually arrived on November 15th in Washington. How many people here took part in one of those marches? Well, thank you. Yeah, you did well. Thank you. How old were you when you did that? Then, yeah, 1969. You were the age of uh, Molly Russia's children, right? Well, let me tell you, uh, kids, <laughs> uh, there are people in this audience, what I'm telling you, who were not older than you, 11 years, than you are now, 11 years ago, who were doing the same job their mothers were doing with their mothers in the streets. They were being counted, as you're being counted here tonight, you're all, we're all being counted. They're being counted by Nixon, who, who got the count, and he got the message. 
it was not the right time to burn North Vietnam to the ground or to use nuclear weapons. So you you accomplished something, which is, I say, I asked another question of Dave and one other, Dave Fox, Dave Nixon, and people who worked on it. What do you think that march in 69 accomplished? Nothing. This is not after the war, but it was years later, 74, 73. The whole movement did it. How could you say otherwise? The bombs were still happening on, it, on Hanover and so forth because we did not know what had been planned, what had been planned. It was secret from us and secret because they knew we would not accept it. Knew that our values, with all the limitations, all the inhumanities, all the indifference, all the apathy, all the ethnocentricities, and everything else were not the values of our leaders in administration after administration who were ready to protect economic interests with the free war. They knew there was that difference and they were not allowed to test how much support they had or didn't have. So you had power. You had power which was the secret, the big secret that had to be kept from you and that's why Nixon told you something some of you will not remember. How many of you remember what Nixon said he was doing on November 15th? 1969, watching the Ohio State on television. Which, how many do you remember that? Yeah. All right, you know, I don't go through all this. If I'd asked you, had you known of his ultimatum, which is in his best selling memoirs, how many would have said, yes, you knew that? Anyone? Would you hear it from me? Yeah, kind of goes down. You didn't know that he said, you knew that you you all know that he was watching a television game on November 15, 1969, and some of you were 12 years old. That's what was important for you to learn. That you didn't come. That the largest demonstrations in history had no effect. They prolonged the life of the species, possibly, by 11 years. They prolonged the moratorium on the first next use of the new right by 11 years. One last thought on that. You don't need to show more power than that, really, and that's the challenge to us. But we've always been asked, supposed to use that power. Won't the heat come down? As it is, as it will. Won't it get tougher here? Won't be quite as easy uh, to demonstrate. We <coughs> block. For many years, those people who were inspired by Gandhi, such as Martin Luther King and others, have faced the challenge. That's all very well against the British or the Americans, let's say. But say they change their character, what if it's against a tough authoritarian police state? How would such tactics work? We didn't have an empirical answer to that, we do now. Ask the Shah's relatives how those tactics work. Unarmed struggle. By the way, Iranians don't call themselves communists, needless to say, or unarmed struggles, but they didn't have any arms, and their struggle was unarmed. And it involved strikes, internal strikes, and it brought down as tight and disciplined and extensively furnished a police state as ever existed. And now, if you want to know what power unarmed tactics and struggle can have, ask the Communist Party of Poland. We have two examples facing us right now, I'm saying of enormous power that has to be acknowledged by anyone, whatever they think of the final uses of that power or how it's coming out or anything else. So the power is there. I believe that's the only kind of power that can change this process. Uh, with all the respect to the singers whom I enjoyed very much, uh, they were, I think they were on their own track, obviously, and even invoking the notion of a neutron bomb in the Pentagon is perhaps the answer to this. There's plenty more kernels where those came from. And they will be better armed the next time the notion of fighting that, their approach with violence, merely obviously confirms the rearming on both sides. You don't abolish war that way, you don't abolish nuclear weapons that way. As a defendant of mine, Rocky Flats, another defendant uh, with me, said, uh, Ellen Claver, the forest ranger, said, you can't fight plutonium with violence. You can't, you won't succeed. I think we do have a chance, and we can succeed by setting another model. And as I say, we've seen enormous power of that. In fact, when I evoke those images, if that seemed to flatter us to even evoke such immense organization as we saw in the rise in Poland, I think it is not too soon to ask ourselves, what do you and I do the day after the U.S. does use a small nuclear weapon in a small war against a country that doesn't have any? Shut it down. 
Well, that's right, a general strike. I think they aim at anything less than organizing as quickly as possible. A general strike in this country of the kind we've seen in Poland that said, that's it. The impeachment as a symbol of impeachment of the entire government. <laughs> see that I'm saying something now that will require an enormous amount of education, alliance building, uh, scarcely exists, of course, with the unions in, on these issues at this point, with a few exceptions, uh, but um, linkage of issues of various kinds that will make people give them the freedom and the courage to act on what I believe will be a widely shared gut feeling of abhorrence and revulsion of what our government had just done. We've got to show them what it takes a last thing to address to the youngest of you, when I'm not <coughs> On a less political note, uh, I remember walking toward the Pentagon at the end of the Continental March for Peace and Social Justice in 1976. And uh, in Washington, and I was marching with a guy who was 67, he had his 67th birthday. He'd walked entirely across the country. And uh, I asked him, and I walked with him at various times across the country as we were to, uh, well, he was the oldest one, he seemed very proud. I said, uh, what do you tell people you hope to accomplish, tell them, by being on a march like this? He said, I tell them that I want to participate in a miracle. He said, it'll be a miracle if this country starts to disarm, and will be a miracle of other countries accomplished. Fortunately, he said, miracles are possible. I was thinking about that. That was in 1976. And I was thinking, you know, it's an unusual kind of miracle he's calling for there. Uh, it's, you've got to give people the thought, he obviously does believe, that it's a miracle that people can participate in or help along. It doesn't happen unless they take part. It's a special kind of miracle. And as I said that, I thought of the fact that at that moment, my wife Patricia was home with Michael in her womb, when we born yet. And I thought, that's this, this kind of miracle we're talking about. It took two people to bring it about, which doesn't make it that sort of cooperation, collaboration, didn't make it sure, but it would be necessary. And it was possible. And not one of us would be here without that miracle having happened. Without the miracle of nurture of which we are all capable with respect to each other and with respect to brother, earth, and sister, fire, and grass, and land. So, those miracles don't happen without hope. The hope that Molly Rush had in taking action that she did along with the others, I'm sure it comes from her knowledge and her experience that she has participated in more than one such miracles, and she has the miracles to show us uh, we're here tonight. I wanted a poem, to have some poems tonight, and I want to close with a poem to your mother and the other her friends, and all our friends here tonight. In fact, a lot of you have by Stephen Sinner. I think continually of those who are truly great, who from the womb Remember the soul's history through corridors of light endless and sitting where the hours of sun. Whose lovely ambition it was that their lips still touched with fire should sing the spirit clothed from head to foot in song, and who snatched from the spring branches the desires that fell across their bodies like lust. It ends. Near the snow, near the sun, in the highest fields, see how these names are fed by the waving grass, and the whistling streamers of cloud and the whispers of wind in the listening sky. The names of those who in their lives fought for life, who wore in their hearts the fire of the center. Born of the sun, they traveled a short while towards the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor. 